Hey friend, I'm Dr. Lee Warren. I am hopefully your favorite internet and maybe real life brain surgeon. And today we're going to do a little self brain surgery here on the podcast. We got three things to talk about today. First, don't make the easy thing the hard thing. Execute a positive action to avoid a negative outcome. And it all comes down to hope. Those are the three things we're going to talk about today. We're going to change our minds and change our lives with a little bit of self brain surgery. Let's get after it right now. Hey, yesterday in the operating room, I had an interesting experience. I had a procedure that we do all the time that's usually very straightforward and very simple. And we had a hard time with one part of the setup for that operation, the x-rays that we need to take to get the patient just lined up just right so that I can do the procedure that I need to do without any difficulty. And what we found was this particular patient's anatomy made it extremely difficult to get the x-ray right before I could go on to the procedure. And we spent probably half an hour, but normally it takes about five minutes. We spent probably half an hour getting the x-ray right before we could start. And I was thinking the whole time about my old professor, Peter Janetta, who said, constantly was saying to us, don't make an operation out of it. And that's a funny thing to say. It doesn't sound that profound, but when you're talking about complex neurosurgical operations, we literally spend 12 hours, 18 hours, 24 hours sometimes doing these big procedures and we call them operations. And Janetta would say, don't make an operation out of it. <laughs> what did he mean? We're literally doing surgery. We're literally doing operations. What did Janetta mean? What PJ meant was don't make the easy thing the hard thing. That's the way I've liked to say it. I've, I've come to over the years. Don't make the easy thing the hard thing. The setup for this operation is the easy thing. It's the actual surgery that's the hard thing, but we spent half an hour and it's something that normally takes three to five minutes and a whole procedure that usually only takes about half an hour. And we doubled the length of the whole operation because the easy thing became the hard thing. We made an operation out of it. So what Peter Janetta was saying to us is, take the things that are the small steps and make them so perfected that you're good enough at them that they don't hinder you from the big mission of getting the whole thing done in an efficient way. If you want to take an 18-hour surgery and turn it into a nine-hour surgery, get those little things that can chew up five minutes and make them take two minutes instead. Not because you're cutting corners, not because you're doing things in an inefficient way, but because you've repped them and systematized them and planned them out and perfected them so much that they don't hinder you and hold you back. When I do surgery... My scrub techs, my amazing scrub techs, Bree and Megan and Jason and Morgan and all of them, everybody who works for us, they come in there and they set that tray up with the instruments that we are most likely to use in the order that we're most likely to use them because they know what I'm going to need. And if I say Kerosene 4 or Penfield number 3, if I call for an instrument that it's time for me to use that instrument at that moment in the operation, and they act like they've never heard of it before, and they have to go and send somebody down the hall and find the instrument and go unwrap it and pull it out and put it on the tray that adds three or four or five or 10 minutes to the operation. Then we're making the easy thing the hard thing. You see where I'm going with this? We avoid that by my scrub techs getting so good at knowing what's coming next that they anticipate what I'm going to ask for so they've got it ready so that the easy thing doesn't become the hard thing and we're not waiting on something that we need every time we always do and every step that we always take, and we can't do it now because the easy thing has become the hard thing. What parts of your life can you plan differently and lay out differently so that you stop making an operation out of everything? That's so important that I made it one of the Ten Commandments of self-brain surgery. Don't make an operation out of everything. And a better, simpler way to say it maybe is don't make the easy thing the hard thing. So that's a lesson that I learned from surgery this week. One really good way, my friend, to stop making the easy thing the hard thing is to take command of the first part of your day. If you find yourself continually stuck, perpetually perplexed and running the same old plays over and over and you find like you're always behind the eight ball and your day never seems manageable, maybe, and this sounds a little crazy, but maybe you need to take 30 minutes and get up earlier and spend some time in quiet reflection and planning and prayer and meditation, thinking about your day in a different way and getting ahead of it. Maybe you need to stop checking your email. Maybe you need to stop checking your Instagram 
first thing in the morning and set your own agenda. Did you know, so even if you're not a, a believer, if you don't believe in God or you're not a Christian or you haven't thought about these kinds of things, let me tell you something that's true from neuroscience that might shock you. It's been shown conclusively in Christians who were studied and Buddhist monks who were studied and meditators who aren't spiritual at all, that the practice of learning to meditate and quiet your mind and spend a few minutes up to about 10 minutes a day for six weeks is how it's been really well studied, that you can expand the actual physical size of the hippocampus of your brain by about 22% by spending 10 minutes or so a day meditating. What does that mean? The hippocampus is the area of your brain that's responsible for emotional resilience, for the ability to switch from one thought process to another, to move away from that limbic fight, flight, freeze response of catastrophe and, oh my goodness, and why is this happening? I got to run away to, hey, wait, I can, I've dealt with this before. I can think differently about that. Getting those frontal lobes involved, that cerebral executive network, that switch happens in the hippocampus. That's why we always say it's become almost a cliche now, but we always say you can't be anxious and grateful at the same time. It's true because in neuroscience, it's like one of those switches that they pull to change the train track from one to the other. Like you literally can't go down the track of anxiety and down the track of gratitude and thankfulness and, and thoughtfulness at the same time. Why? Because hippocampus switches one direction for the other. And your hippocampus gets more robust and stronger and more resilient and more wired towards the frontal lobe non-reaction but response mode when you meditate and pray. So what does that mean? It means if you take command of the morning of your day, the first part of your day, and you spend some time in quiet reflection, thinking, listening to classical music has been shown, by the way, to really help you get into that alpha state of your brain and away from that stressed out, hyper-focused beta state that we all wake up in, that your brain will calm down when you listen to some good music. I like worship music. I like to spend some time reading my Bible and, and praying in the morning. You can do it however you want. And whether you even want to completely despiritualize it, that's fine. The, the research shows that your brain becomes more resilient when you take command of your time and spend some time focusing and meditating and whether you want to call it prayer or not. We'll talk more about that later. And I've got a whole podcast, by the way, the Spiritual Brain Surgery Podcast. We talk about that kind of stuff, the spiritual side of it all the time. But just from this pure neuroscience standpoint, your brain gets more robust and more resilient and more able to make good decisions under pressure when you spend some time meditating and praying. And that's how you can stop making the easy thing the hard thing. That's how you do it. Now let's pivot. I'm going to talk about something else for a minute, and they're related. But I'm, I'm thinking about a moment in surgery yesterday when I was about to do something dangerous, Okay. There was a nerve exposed and there was a bone spur pressing in. I needed to use a drill. The bone was too hard for a, a biting instrument and I needed to use a drill. The drill's scary if you're not really talented using it. And it's scarier if you really are talented using it because you know exactly what can happen if you're not careful. But we have a 1.5 millimeter titanium drill bit that's spinning at 150,000 RPMs next to a nerve that's controlling somebody's leg or somebody's arm or the ability to do a certain thing. And I've got to use that drill right next to that nerve to drill that bone spur away. How do I do that safely? First, I have to plan to take a positive action to avoid a negative outcome. I have to make some decisions. I have to put some things in place. I tell Damon, my amazing PA, to hold an instrument between me and the nerve. So I'm drilling against his instrument and not against the nerve. So if my hand slips a little bit, it's going to hit Damon's retractor and not the nerve underneath. I'm going to put some cotton padding between me and the nerve. I'm going to brace my hand with my other hand up against the patient so that I cannot slip and I can't accidentally move forward or back towards the nerve. I'm going to make some decisions ahead of time to make sure that I can execute that maneuver safely. Now, apply this to your life. When you hear a funny noise or a sound or I get a text message from somebody that sets you off, your first thought is to go to catastrophization. Oh, no, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. And that's going to happen. And she's going to leave. And he's going to fire me. Or they always overlook me. Or this is never going to work out. And you immediately find yourself way down the path of this worst case scenario outcome. What happened? What happened is you didn't prepare ahead of time to take positive action to avoid a negative outcome. If you tell your mind, hey, here's what's going to happen today. And you spend that quiet time in the morning 
and you tell yourself, hey, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to get in a situation at some point today in this meeting and just going to try to push my buttons or I'm going to get that phone call and this thing I've been dreading is going to come to pass. And when it does, here's how I'm going to respond to it. Here's what I'm going to say. Now, that's not the same as what you do in the shower or when you're driving to work and you're letting so-and-so have the business and you're telling them exactly what you would say and all that, running down that path of I'm going to blow this person up and all that that we all do sometimes. It's not the same as that. It's saying, I'm going to get ahead of this operation. I'm going to think through the steps of the procedure. I'm going to think through the calendar events on my day, and I'm going to make some decisions about how I'm going to handle them with my amazing executive control frontal lobes and not with my emotion. I'm not going to let somebody lure me into an emotional decision-making mode or reaction mode because I'm going to make the easy thing work better for me. I'm not going to trip and fall into the ditch of making the easy thing the hard thing because I'm going to prepare. And the way you do that is you take positive actions to avoid a negative outcome. If you're worried that your kids aren't going to be there when you get older, they're not going to take care of you and they're not going to love you and they're not going to show up for you, then you need to show up for them now. If you're concerned that people aren't sending you the birthday card or people aren't calling you or nobody's noticing you, you need to notice them. Become the person who writes the card, who makes the phone call, who sends the flowers, who shows up for the birthday. Become the person who shows up at the baseball game. And guess what? Your grandkids will show up when you're sick because you showed up for them. So instead of sitting in your house alone, wondering why nobody's calling you, get out and engage. If you feel lonely and you don't have any family, literally go volunteer somewhere. Go to a church, sign up for a group, go down and volunteer for Meals on Wheels. Do something positive to avoid the negative interaction. Become the person who will be missed if you're not there. And then when you aren't there because you're sick, somebody's going to call and check on you. Somebody's going to come see you because you invested the time and you took the positive action to avoid the negative result. That's what I have to do in surgery. That's what I have to do in the operating room. And that's what you can do if you take control of your morning. Another thing you can do that will really help you clear your mind and prepare yourself for the day is to avoid email and social media first thing in the morning. Because if you do get into email or social media first thing in the morning, you are going to get sucked into someone else's agenda for your day. Somebody else wants you thinking about this product that they want you to buy or this meeting that they want you to attend or this thing that they need from you. Somebody else wants you to spend money, spend time, look at them in a certain way, accomplish something on their behalf, do something for their agenda. Somebody else wants you, my friend, to obey their agenda for your day, and you want to obey your agenda for your day. You want to set your intention and follow through, as my Peloton instructor used to say. That's how you win the day. You win the morning first, okay? Take positive actions to avoid a negative outcome, and don't make the easy thing the hard thing, and the last thing for this day, for this episode, is it all comes down to hope. There's this incredible story in the Bible. It's told in Romans chapter 4, I think in verse 16, where Paul, the apostle who's writing the book of Romans, talks about the old guy Abraham from the Old Testament. Father Abraham, right? Father of the whole nation, okay? Abraham was an old man, and God told him, came to him and said, you're going to be the father of a great nation. And he really said, wait, hold on a second. I'm almost 100 years old, and I don't have any children. How can I be the father of a great nation? He said, your wife's going to have a baby. And she laughed. Sarah laughed because it, they were 100 years old almost. Who has a baby when they're 100 years old? They didn't believe the news that they were receiving because it was impossible. But what the Bible says is Abraham did believe it. It says, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. I drew some graphs in my book, my, my last book, Hope is the First Dose. I drew some graphs about this. The difference between what happens when you lose hope and what happens when you gain hope, the gap is called faith. It's the gap between against all hope and hope. And that's what Abraham did. So sometimes you can't see a way forward. The situation seems impossible. It doesn't seem manageable. You've, you've gotten the phone call. You've lost the child. Your husband has left. You've developed the tumor. Whatever it is, it seems impossible. 
But you've got to remember that hope and hardship run on parallel tracks. I talked about this in my video from yesterday. Go check it out. Hope and hardship run on parallel tracks. You can't live, you can't survive hardship without hope. Because if a train only has one track, it's going to run off into the ditch. It's going to crash. You got to have both tracks. So hope allows you to drive forward through your life with resilience and purpose and meaning and maybe even happiness because you can get there from here. You're not going to fall off the track because hope is keeping you anchored. So hope makes a difference in everything. Hope is everything. Hopelessness is deadlier than cancer. I've studied that for years now. I've seen it in my own life. Hopelessness is the deadliest thing that can happen to somebody. If you lose your hope, my friend, you lose everything. So hold on to hope. Abraham, against all hope, in hope, believed. He said, I don't even know this situation. God's telling me I can have a kid almost 100 years old, but I'm going to hope he's telling the truth because I have faith in him. He's come through for me before. He'll come through for me again. That's the way I look at it from a scriptural standpoint. You can look at it however you want, but just remember, if you could go back in time and talk to yourself before some prior massive thing happened, you could give yourself some compassionate advice with what you know now, one thing that you would say for sure to that former version of yourself before they went through that hard thing is you would look him in the eyes like my dad says, hey, look in my eyes. If you're not watching this on video, by the way, this is on YouTube. And I put it there because I want you to see my eyes. I don't like to see myself on video. I don't like how I look on video. I make weird expressions with my face. But I'm putting it up. I'm going to start putting the podcast on video every time because I want you to look in my eyes when I say this right here. If you could go back in time, one thing you would tell yourself is, hey, guess what? This feels impossible, but you made it through that. There's going to come a time down the road when you're going to say, I made it through that. God got me through that. Faith got me through that. Hope got me through that. My family helped me get through that. My resilience helped me get through that. I learned how not to make an operation out of everything. I learned not to make the easy thing the hard thing. I learned to take positive actions to avoid a negative outcome. And I did all that because I was able to hold on to hope. Hope is a verb. It's not an accident. It's not a passive process. It comes from memory. Remember you made it through before. Remember you got through that hard thing before. Remember other people have survived this cancer. Remember other people have made it through a divorce. Other people have come through when they lost a child. So you can too. And then you move towards the promise of a future that includes you having survived that thing. You move towards the promises that God made. You move towards the fact that neuroscience says you can develop resilience by learning to meditate, by taking command of your morning, by not making the easy thing, the hard thing. And you gain hope and hope creates momentum and momentum breaks inertia and overcoming inertia allows you to start moving and no longer will you find yourself feeling sad or sick or stressed or stuck anymore because you changed your mind and you changed your life, friend. There's three things. Don't make the easy thing the hard thing. Take positive actions to avoid negative outcomes. And remember that everything comes down to hope because you can't change your life until you change your mind. And it's Mind Change Monday, and that's what we're all about today. Before you go, take a minute and think about one thing that should be easy in your life that you commonly turn into a hard thing. We talk about today in this episode, don't make the easy thing the hard thing. So what's something that turns into hard stuff that you could rethink and take mind top-down control over and turn it into the easy thing again, like it should be? And what's some place where you could take positive action in your life to avoid a negative outcome? Is there some place that over and over and over it just feels way harder than it should be or that you're having outcomes that aren't optimal because you didn't take some positive action to avoid that catastrophization or that negative outcome? that now seems so inevitable? And is there some place in your life where hope could be helpful, where you've forgotten that you can get there from here, where you've forgotten that other people have made it before? Is there some place where hope could rise again? Think about those things, write them down, maybe journal about it a little bit, because in medical science we say, what doesn't get documented didn't happen. If you don't write it down, you don't chart it, you don't put it in the record, then it never happens. So you gotta make progress by being willing to Put yourself out there. Write down the things that you think about and that make a difference in your life. Thanks for your time today. Subscribe to the channel. Hit that like button. Share it with your friends. And don't forget that hope is the first dose. It's not just a great book. It is a good book. You should go read it. But hope is the first dose to any kind of plan that gets you moving forward in your life again. That's the news for today, my friend. The good news is 
You can start today. I say it at the end of every podcast episode. You can start today because no matter how much time you've spent wishing it could be different, you can't get there from here because what got you here won't get you there unless you change your mind. You got to change your mind and you can do it starting today. Mm -hmm.